Since cars first started to roll, the wealthy, famous, I'm, uh, busy, and yes, those outside the law, have turned to limousines as their favorite way to cruise down the road in comfort. Passengers retreat to the back seat of a limousine not only for how it makes them feel on the inside, but also for how it makes others feel on the outside. A limousine has really been constructed to be the epitome of creating high profile. People want to use a high profile vehicle to let people know they've arrived. Everybody wants to feel special. Everybody wants to feel like they have the world in their hand. And when you're riding in the back of a stretch limousine, you truly feel that it's your night. It'll get you from point A to point B, but it's the way it gets you from point A to point B. It's about style. It's about image. It's about illusion. The word limousine comes from a French word for a hooded garment worn by shepherds to protect them from rain and cold. But today's limousines have come a long way from just offering shelter. If cover is all you're looking for, you might as well get in one of these. But this is definitely not a limousine. Like a limousine, a taxi cab does have separate compartments for driver and passenger. But unlike a cab, a modern limousine it has to be stretched somewhere between six and 200 inches that has added amenities that are strictly geared for the luxury of the passenger. Passenger luxury, the essence of any limousine, has inspired some extreme vehicle designs. Taking just about any car but the traditional sedan, customizers have pushed, pounded, and pulled limos into new shapes and sizes. And as limousines have been stretched to greater and greater lengths, the notion of what constitutes luxury inside them has been stretched as well. Massage table, that would be a hell of a way to relax. Get done watching a movie and being massaged would just be the way to go. Get done with a glass of champagne and it's like a home on wheels. You could design a limousine that incorporated some uh, magic illusions. Uh, if you had a big limousine, you had guests, you could disappear from one end of the limousine and reappear behind them. Make it the biggest freaking thing in town and I'd put a jacuzzi, a bed. All my uh, couches instead of leather, I'd have them the plush leopard print. Ooh. What I want is a spa on wheels. <laughs> you could call it a, a spa limo. A spa limo. You could have a dance floor. You could have some cages, dance floor. some swings. Whoa. How did things get to this point? Just like this, in a carriage. Roman road building encouraged the development of carpenta. Lavish carriages for the imperial family or wealthy merchants that started us down this path to unrestrained luxury. In the 15th century, Hungarians developed the modern version of this. The coach, a closed carriage with an elevated outside seat for the driver or coachman. By the late 1700s, 14,000 carriages could be found rolling through the streets of Paris. Since ownership of a carriage was no longer a mark of distinction, carriage makers built palaces on wheels for royalty and the wealthy. Ostentation became the mark of social standing. Napoleon's campaign carriage had a bedroom, library, and a butler's pantry. In America, mass production supplied low-cost carriages and buggies to customers eager to take to the road. The prominent formal carriage makers of the horse-drawn age, like Brewster, Kimball, and the Fisher Brothers, to name just a few, went forward into the automotive age to make the finest coaches or bodies for limousines. First appearing in Paris in 1899, Limousines combine the craftsmanship of formal carriages with the technological possibilities of the future. As this 1908 description of a limousine interior illustrates, all the woodwork is Spanish mahogany, silver flower holders fill up the corners, and every piece of metalwork in sight is silver plated. And there are speaking tubes, electric ceiling lights, and electric signaling devices between passengers and driver. Innovation, like speaking tubes, was driven by the changing demands of the motoring age. In a horse-drawn carriage, directions were as simple, to the opera and back. 
But with the advent of engines, destinations multiplied, as did the need for communication between chauffeur and passenger. Hence, the speaking tube. It might be amplified or it might not, but it would, it would uh, blow a brass tube, would go out towards the chauffeur's ear, it's a trumpet, and then you just bark the order into him. This was, of course, because convention dictated that the chauffeur in early limousines was outside, exposed to the weather, just as his predecessor, the coachman, had been in a carriage. But unlike a coachman, these early chauffeurs had the upper hand with their dependent passengers. Very few of the backseat riders knew how to drive, let alone fix their unreliable vehicles. Early car, everything went wrong, particularly flat tires, constantly losing. So if you own a car, you wanted to use a car, you had to have someone there to manage it for you. This gave chauffeurs power that was sometimes abused. There was one chauffeur that would put sawdust in, in, inside the engine and say the boss is something wrong with the car. And the boss had to go buy a new whatever was wrong with the car. And guess what? The chauffeur was getting a commission on every new part in that car. In the 1920s, as automobiles sped ever faster, fully enclosed cabs were designed to protect chauffeurs from wind, dust, and cold. Glass dividers came into vogue to separate servant from employer. Solid dividers emerged with the development of intercom systems, giving passengers the option of full privacy. To combat the hot, stale air of the closed compartment, the 1930s actually saw a primitive form of air conditioning developed inside a limousine. Their trick was they, they mounted a case in the trunk, hooked up some fans, put ice in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the box, and blew the air over the ice and then into the back seat of the limousine. And there you have early air conditioning. Although necessity was the mother of much innovation, the demands of the wealthy were responsible for the most outlandish creativity. Al Capone's 1930 Cadillac V16 featured bulletproof glass, inch armor plating, portholes for returning fire, smokescreen capability, and an escape hatch on the floor. Hitler's limousine suited the dictator's outsized ego. He settled for nothing less than a 20-foot Mercedes 770K with a 7.7-liter supercharged engine. The armored 10,000-pound car could cruise the Autobahn at a startling 108 miles per hour. Of course, a king could be the most demanding. Elvis Presley's solid gold Cadillac got its name from the six gold records inlaid in the interior ceiling. It also contained an electric razor, electric shoe buffer, 45 RPM record player, and ice maker. The exterior paint was flecked with dust from pearls and diamonds. The record player didn't work too well unless you're sitting in a parking lot. <laughs> it would bounce a bit. No matter how famous or worldly a passenger might be, the back seat of a limousine can still inspire awe. I remember spending three days in the early 90s with, with uh, President Gorbachev when he had just left office in the Soviet Union. All he wanted to talk about on the visit was everything connected with the limousine. How was it built? How long was it? And he was playing with the, with the buttons and making the divider go up and down. It, he was fascinated and the car made him smile. For the most part, however, a wealthy individual's limousine simply offers continuity of lifestyle. He basically wants this vehicle to be an extension of the luxury home that he lives in, the luxury hotel room that he stays in, and the first class airplane seat that he sits in. And it all has to be seamless for him. Of course, today's stretch limousine isn't just for the well-heeled. Coming up, just exactly how much cash does it take? to have this 40-foot party limousine at your beck and call. Once the province of the rich and famous who owned custom-made limousines, the back seat is now open to all, at a price. Whether you're taking out four of your closest friends, on the go to a business meeting, or just heading to the casino for a night's work, access to a limousine can be rented. In fact, 93% of the limousines on the road today are for hire. Good afternoon, sir. You can transform yourself just by stepping inside. 
you're creating the illusion of wealth and power and coolness. So even if you're not rich and powerful and cool, you can ride in a limo for a few hours and you can make people believe you are. It's like a magic trick. When you're riding in the back of this car and you're watching the lights of Broadway, you feel like you're on top of the world. And that's the experience we're selling. The price of that experience can be as much as $200 an hour for a top-of-the-line party machine. In the chauffeured transportation business, this occasional renting, proms, weddings, nights on the town, is called retail. The other category, corporate, includes all business travel and is dominated by companies like Devel, the largest privately held limousine company in the world. If you look at a breakdown of business today, 80% of our business would be corporate, which would include rock and roll, entertainment, music and movies, as well as general Wall Street corporate business, and 20% of our business still remains retail. But that big shift has been a big boost to the industry. It's a boost because corporations are spending big money on limousine transportation. A big corporate client could spend $10 million a year. A small corporate client, like a small advertising agency, could spend $5,000 a year. But some retail customers are spending top dollar, too. A large individual Dayville customer could spend $300,000 a year getting picked up every day, taken shopping, taken out, and just living their normal life. And the opposite spectrum of that would be somebody who uses a limousine once and spends $500. While in college in 1978, Dayville president Scott Solombrino spent his last $600 to buy his first limo. He now runs an empire that controls almost 15,000 vehicles, both limousines and sedans, in 580 cities worldwide. Dayville generally keeps a limousine for only three years, replacing one-third of the fleet each year. At 28 feet long, the heavy stretch limousines put extra strain on their brakes and have to be constantly maintained. We have more weight shifting. You have TVs, VCRs, DVD players, CD players. You got ice chests that get filled with ice. You have stock that goes in the limousine. Plus, it can carry more people than a sedan could. These vehicles receive an obsessive amount of cosmetic care. They're washed as often as three times a day and, of course, lovingly waxed. Wax twice is recommendable, but uh, triple wax is the best. After that, then you just go ahead and rewash the car again. If the wax stays on there, that's how we can tell if we have good products. The wax should stay there at least 15 car washes. But there's more to a limousine than just the hardware. The total experience really is about the driver. The car is the tool. The driver has to make it happen. I look at it as you're coming into my office, you're coming into my home, and I try to make you feel as comfortable, and I can, I can get you anything, I can show you the town. I think the big distinction is that when someone wants a driver, a driver is someone who delivers a pizza. A true professional chauffeur is undoubtedly going to be drug tested, he was background checked before he was hired, and is a person that, that can be trusted. You have to know how to accelerate so that the person in the back could literally be standing there with a glass of water in their hand and not spill any of the water. Maybe it's a celebrity or a, a, a sports team owner. They expect a five-star service. Sometimes they're very demanding and they need it, you know, they really need it now, now, now. In the dawn of the for hire era, the teens and 20s, the demand for service was just as great. J.P. Carey, a Grand Central Station barber, sees the opportunity to start a for-hire limousine business. From his vantage point in the train station, Carey saw the need for out-of-town business people and tourists to hire stylish transportation around Manhattan. He launched the first successful service in the U.S. in 1921 in New York City. His company, the Grand Central Packard Renting Corporation, featured some of the best limousines of the day. Packards and Cadillacs. Tightened purse strings during the Depression forced limousine owners to sell their cars to carry, strengthening his business. People would call him up and say, hey, I want you to buy my car, hire my chauffeur, and I'll hire you whenever I want him. 
So the, the for hired limousine is actually benefited by an economic downturn at this point because people can't keep them for themselves, so they hire his on a part-time basis. This economic downturn put the nail in the coffin of the elite custom bodybuilding companies like Brewster, Brun, and Willoughby. Most either went out of business or survived the depression in name only as a division of a larger company like Fleetwood and LeBaron. This was the beginning of the age of the factory limousine, a vehicle whose chassis and body would be built under one roof, the factory roof. The Cadillac Series 75, manufactured from the 40s through the 70s, combined the exclusivity of a coach-built custom car with the efficiencies of mass production. Cadillac built roughly 2,000 of these limousines a year. And although these numbers were inadequate for financial success, the car was a marketing tool for Cadillac and for Kerry International. Kerry's rapidly expanding limousine empire was on its way to becoming the largest and only publicly traded limo company in the world. As Kerry's business expanded, he turned to the Series 75 to standardize his fleet, and Cadillac turned to him to test their product. The 1956 had a dog of a, a transmission. They would send so much of transmissions to Kerry, they would just replace them. They had one that lasted 80,000 miles. And so Cadillac said, send it to us, take it out, and it's oil and everything. We want to see what went right. And so they helped the company uh, uh, develop a better transmission. With the gas crisis of the 70s and increasing consciousness of the bottom line, Cadillac discontinued the Series 75 in 1976 and replaced it with a downsized limousine the following year. Ironically, this proved to be an opportunity for even bigger limousines to dominate American roads. The demise of the factory limousine created a market for custom stretch limousines. But with the economic boom of the 1980s, the chauffeured transportation industry continued to grow. When Salambrino joined Davell in the early 80s, there were a thousand companies in the country. By 1990, that number had grown to 12,000. In the corporate world, the limousine had become both a status symbol and a safety tool. If you're a big corporation and you're doing a party for 300 people, you're going to make sure that those 300 people have a ride home because you don't want your corporation to have the liability of having an accident of someone who might have been drinking at your corporate event. Next, since Cadillac no longer makes a factory limousine, how does this become this? Stretch limousines. They're the biggest cars on the road. Hard to coax around corners, and almost impossible to park. But despite the vehicle's imposing size, the manufacture and sale of limousines is a surprisingly small business. As the U.S. economy bubbled in the late 1990s, so did the sale of limousines, peaking at a mere 9,000 vehicles before falling to 4,000 in 2001. Right now we are in a stretched Cadillac limousine. This is a 2003 model and uh, it was stretched by the largest coach builder in the world, Crystal Enterprises of Bria, California, and it was lovingly cut down the middle and stretched 100 inches. Cut down the middle? That's no way to treat a luxury automobile, but it is the first step in making a stretch. Most of the conversion from sedan to stretch is done by hand just as it was a century ago when the first limousines were introduced to wealthy customers. This target group, which was used to comfort, was not about to end up behind the wheel of a Model T. Like the ride in early automobiles, the transition from luxury horse-drawn carriages to limousines was not smooth. An automobile could travel faster than a horse, but would have to be heavy to withstand the stress. In addition, discerning customers had no intention of scrimping on luxury, and this meant added weight. Engines simply couldn't keep up. You couldn't have a full, enclosed, fully luxurious carriage pulled by a, a motor that only put out 10, 15 horsepower. This limitation hindered the limousine's acceptance. It would take two innovations to propel the limousine past the horse-drawn carriage. The development of the all-steel body in 1912, bringing strength without added weight, and the greater engine capacity resulting from the industrial surge of World War I. 
But the public's low opinion of automobiles, they were seen as noisy and dirty, remained a greater obstacle for the limousine than technical considerations. Despite owning two Pierce Arrow limousines, President Taft rode to his 1909 inauguration in a carriage. However, while president, his love of motoring popularized automobiles and brought acceptance to the limousine. By 1921, President Warren Harding rode in an automobile from the Capitol to the White House on Inauguration Day, ushering in the classic era of the custom coach-built limousine. The coach-built car is a car that is sent to a third party to make the coach, to make the, the passenger compartment. They take the factory car, which is the chassis. The chassis looks like an engine, the wheels, and the transmission all the way down the middle. And then from the front seats on back, someone else builds the rest of it. There were rare exceptions, like the Pierce Arrow Company in Buffalo, New York, that succeeded in making both a high-quality chassis and coach. Although this approach made for beautiful limousines, it wasn't the most durable business model. In fact, innovators rarely stayed in business long. And such was the fate of Skip Lehman and Robert Peterson. In 1963, inspired by the quality of the Lincoln Continental of the early 60s, they cut Lehman's Lincoln in half and added three feet to it, giving birth to what is now the dominant limousine on the road, the Stretch. Their car included modifications such as permanent rear-facing seating, dual air conditioning for front and rear compartments, mini televisions and mobile phones, that are considered standard on contemporary stretch limousines. In conjunction with Ford, Lehman Peterson made 500 cars before a design change in the Continental model caused a contractual and warranty issue with Ford that forced an end to production in 1970. The stretch limousines of today are still made the old-fashioned way by cutting a sedan in two. But wait a second. Before chopping the body, some decisions have to be made. And that's where Crystal Enterprises comes into the picture. I build what you want. Do you want leather? Do you want a DVD? Do you want a sunroof? I've done some wild cars. I've done some conservative cars. Um, but it's basically what my client's looking for. If you're a private individual, you want all the amenities just as if you were sitting in your own living room at home. A living room on wheels starts with a special car, a Lincoln Town Car or a Cadillac. It's a heavy-duty chassis. It's not a car that you could purchase outside in the field. Only the manufacturer can purchase this vehicle. There's 22 processes going through conversion. We probably have a little over 400 men that are working on the conversion going through the process. It takes 12 days from start to finish. Before taking the saw to the car, workers weld in support cross pieces. It's basically to keep the car square so it doesn't, when they cut it, it won't open up. Then it all starts with a 14 inch abrasion saw. With the end stabilized by a jig, the frame, floorboard, roof, and side beams are lengthened by inches. Lots of inches. This one is a 120, and uh, they have 100, and uh, the smaller ones are 68. It all depends on the size that they want. And those inches add up to feet, lengthening the vehicle by as much as 50%. Everything under the car, including fuel lines and brake lines, has to be lengthened. This is a drive shaft. Okay. They'll be replacing this later on with another one from powertrain, a longer one depending on the size of the vehicle. And all these longer parts are custom and must be fabricated on site. The machine is a 175 ton uh, Niagara press brake. It makes side panels, it makes the roofs, it makes the lower side skins for the cars, the floors. Then from our mechanical, we go into paint. We strip the sides and everything on the vehicle so it's a complete smooth color. Then it comes from there to electrical. What are we gonna put in that car? Are we gonna use DVD, surround sound, single CD? And all the amenities are gonna take extra electricity to run. Dual AC, dual alternators. The second alternator is if you have a 10 disc and you add a surround sound. You have three choices on the top, which is called a tuxedo vinyl or an elk grain vinyl, or then a canvas top, which is a cloth top. The vinyl top, an indispensable piece of limo style, has a practical purpose as well. 
As the vehicle passes over bumps, the body twists. Over time, this causes creases to develop in the steel top, which are concealed by the vinyl. A man-made monsoon ensures that all seals are watertight. With the exterior complete, it's time to come in out of the rain and install all the toys. Almost everything that goes inside the limousine has to be fabricated by hand. Every bar is made up prior to installation, so we know exactly how that bar is going to be before we put it into the vehicle. You have the 120s, which you have an option of your carbon fiber bar or a wood bar or a painted bar, depending on what your needs are. Even the choice of seating, J seating named for a shape, or individual seats indicates the use to which the limousine will be put. A J seat is your party car, your wedding car, um, that everybody gets to sit together, they're close-knit. When you split the seats up, then you're in your corporate world because then they go into separate entities. Finally, the limousine is complete, but it doesn't go out the door yet. Every crystal vehicle, sometimes as many as 160 a month, goes through a 20-page checklist to ensure quality control. So to stretch a sedan into a limo at Crystal Enterprises, all you've got to do is cut it, extend the body, drive shaft, brake lines and fuel lines, undercoat it, paint it, enhance the electrical, add trim, vinyl top, check for leaks, install amenities like seating, bars, TV, CD players, detail it, do quality control, and get it in and out the door in just 12 days. No problem. In the custom limousine business, companies like Crystal strive to keep their customers happy, as Kay did with a demanding client. The vehicle was shipping to the Philippines, and he wanted a urinal. <laughs> it's the only time I've been requested for a urinal, but yes, we were able to do it for him. <laughs> now that's customer service. Clearly, luxury means different things to different people. Up next, bound for Bogota, cruising through Compton, how a limousine could save your life. Long associated with luxury and leisure, Limousines have become a way of life for business people seeking to economize their time and energy. The further up the corporate ladder an executive climbs, the more sense a limo makes. Because when you calculate everybody's hourly rate, when a guy's making 20 or 30 million dollars a year, does he have time to really drive around and get lost in the streets? Open over there. I'm going. We're all too familiar with what an office looks like. Fluorescent lighting, cubicles. For Richard Barber, a day at the office looks like this. I needed to lower my overhead and provide a specialized service which is in person. So I thought if I could use the limousine to be a roaming office that it might be something that could possibly work. There's very little that can be done in an office that can't be done in the back of a limousine. I'm on the phone talking to clients, customer service answering questions. I'm interfacing with escrow companies, title companies, marketing companies, uh, my, my employees, my loan counselors, my loan processors. The limousine hasn't only reduced overhead. It's allowed Richard to meet clients face to face, increasing his percentage of loans sold. Another benefit to the limousine is that going in the traffic is really hellacious nowadays. Where we can go on the fast lane, I can sit back here, be comfortable, get prepared. When I first purchased the limousine, you know, there is a, a kind of a, uh, an aura that goes with this. The first couple of months, you feel kind of like a celebrity. After that, you kind of you know, get over that, and it just becomes a working uh, machine for you. Well, when you drive up in a limousine, people realize that you've been successful, and uh, I think it kind of works for me. Okay, thank you, Rich. My time now, it's so streamlined, so pinpoint. I mean, uh, every, every minute is taken care of. Uh, the, when I drive my own vehicle, the parking here or the, on the freeways, uh, it's just really, it's just really bad sometimes here in L.A. For the limousine, I get in the fast lane and uh, I'm back there uh, just taking care of business. In many dangerous cities around the world, the first order of business is personal safety. Many corporate and personal limousines strive to be far safer than the cities that they're driving through. Since 1940, O'Gara Hessen Eisenhardt has been one of the premier armored vehicle and limousine companies in the world. Our customer base is pretty widely varied from very high level customers that are VIPs or um, diplomats, uh, 
princes and kings in, in different countries. Although O'Gara has a long history of making presidential limousines, spanning from Truman through the present, for security reasons they don't talk about this side of their business. As the core of our business is to provide protection, part of that entails not revealing specifics about our customer base or the products that we provide specific customers. The first step in protection is threat assessment, determining who the client's enemies are and how sophisticated their attack might be. Will they use handguns, rockets, armor-piercing bullets, bombs? Once this determination is made, O'Gara Hessen Eisenhart goes to work providing the customer the chance to escape an attack. The main premise for an armored vehicle is to buy seconds of time to get out of a region where you're being attacked. So the essence of protection is not offense, but solid defense. What we have to do is tear down that vehicle, uh, take all of the trim out, take the original glass out, and build an armored cage inside of that vehicle to provide any type of protection, whether it be from handguns up to assault rifle type threats. We replace the original glass with uh, multi-layered glass and polycarbonate. It's basically a construction of glass with plastic layers and it can be um, anywhere uh, as thick as an inch for handgun protection up to three inches or more for some of the, the more lethal assault rifle type threats. When the first impact hits, it breaks up some of the layers of glass, but the, the plastic layers still remain intact and hold everything together so that that whole system can withstand several shots, multiple shots in the same area. For added protection, the vehicle's body can be lined with high hardness steel. This product was developed for nuclear submarines and combines a hard exterior that shatters bullets with an elastic core that absorbs the remaining energy. When you get into assault rifle protection, then we're starting to add a little bit more weight because we do use advanced high hardness steels, but steel is pretty heavy. In some cases, we can add a couple thousand pounds to a vehicle. On the lighter side is the high performance polymer fiber called Kevlar. It's basically just a plastic fiber that's uh, drawn down into a very specific uh, super high strength properties. So it's lightweight and it's really strong. It's actually woven into a fabric, uh, much like the fabric in, in clothes, and that is really good at defeating uh, uh, handgun threats. Every component is rigorously tested. The only way to validate that that whole armor system works is to actually shoot the, the components. One of the best ways to avoid attacks is to keep a low profile. A really important element of creating armored vehicles is making sure that the vehicle looks like the original vehicle to the extent possible. Um, because if you're going to buy an armored vehicle, you don't want to stand out as being a target. The company maintains a database of attacks on their vehicles in order to keep their designs responsive to evolving threats. One of the painful lessons came on November 22, 1963, when President Kennedy was assassinated in an O'Gara and Hess armored Lincoln. Unfortunately, politics trumped security that day, and the president rode in his armored limousine with the top removed. Convertibles had long been popular presidential rides because they allowed maximum visibility for the chief executive. After Kennedy's assassination, his most versatile limousine, a Lincoln Continental named the X-100, was upgraded to a higher security standard. Originally 7,800 pounds and $200,000 to make, the revamped vehicle weighed in at a staggering 9,500 pounds and cost more than a million dollars. It featured a fixed top, titanium reinforcements, bulletproof tires, and air filters designed to thwart poison gas. While serving as vice president, Richard Nixon was grateful for the security of his limousine. In 1958, while on a goodwill tour of South America, the vice president's limousine was battered with rocks during an anti-U.S. demonstration in Caracas, Venezuela. Nonetheless, once he became president, Nixon insisted that a hinged roof panel be added to the X-100 that would allow him to play to crowds. Numerous chief executives since Woodrow Wilson have been chauffeured in Cadillacs, and that tradition continues with the current president's 2001 DeVille. 
This car, the roadside equivalent of Air Force One, has five inches of military-grade armor. The car's windows don't open, so as not to compromise the environmentally sealed interior, designed to protect the occupants from chemical and biological attacks. Not surprisingly, the specs on the highest security limousine in the country are classified. Coming up, the man who put the exotic in exotic limousines. She got an and they're all on fire inside. Every city has its own special personality, and no place more so than Las Vegas is the nut capital of the world. We have volcanoes and pyramids and pirate ships. We have castles, everything you can imagine, all on one street. Uh, Las Vegas is the excess capital of the world. Amidst all this excess, a certain kind of limousine has come into its own, the exotic limousine. The exotic limousine is when a normal limousine, as we might call it, isn't enough to outrage. The exotic serves the purpose of, let's say, pushing the volume up to 11. The normal limousine, a stretched Lincoln or Cadillac sedan, is built by a coachmaker following specific guidelines from the manufacturer. The main constraint is that the stretch is not to exceed 130 inches, an 8 to 10 passenger limousine. The exotics, stretched SUVs, trucks, Jaguars, just about any car with four or more wheels, thumb their collective nose at these guidelines. We're in a 2002 Ford Excursion. It's an SUV. It's been converted into a limo. Uh, it's been stretched 220 inches, which is approximately 18 and a half feet. Um, it's the longest SUV limo in Las Vegas. It's got a fog machine, it's got laser lights, it's got a disco light that spins around. The sound system is second to none. Uh, it's about 3,000 watts of power. There's 16 speakers in here and it cranks. Anything that you would see or the ambiance that you create in a nightclub, we've created inside this vehicle. This 14,000 pound mammoth limo rolls through the 115 degree Las Vegas heat, packed with up to 22 passengers. Blasting the music, blowing the fog, and cranking the air conditioning. Electricity is a major issue. This vehicle has dual alternators, dual AC compressors. It has 290 amp alternators which have been modified. It also has four batteries instead of the standard two that a uh, normal Ford Excursion would have. So there's uh, actually a set of racing cells that are up underneath here that uh, are high output batteries that, have been, that uh, power all this back here. People want something a little more unique than the standard limo. The marketplace, as we're finding it, is that you have to be on a, a little bit different to pull the, the people in. And these limousines really pull the people in. At about $100,000 to build, this stretched excursion rents for $200 an hour. For the last 30 years, Vinnie Bergman of Ultra Coach Builders has more or less been the P.T. Barnum of the exotic limousine business. We've made limos with jacuzzis, swimming pools, wine cellars, microwaves, uh, hair dryers, blenders, coffee pots. One of his many claims to fame is the Chic Mobile that he designed and built. This 65-foot exotic has four televisions, four moonroofs, a hot tub, weighs more than 14,000 pounds and is articulated. It has a hitch in the middle so that it can bend around corners and is one of the longest street legal vehicles in the world. Chic Mobile was a million and a half dollar project. It was articulated. So you can pull up with 40 people, eight in the front, 32 in the back. You can pull up to one club, press a button, zzzz, the back would come off like a trailer with its with self-contained generator and the other limo can go all over town, come back at 2 o'clock and hook back up and leave. That was for some chic. Now owned by Limo Bob Strasser of Star Limo, the chic has been repainted and renamed the Patriot. It can be rented for $400 an hour and a staff of midget waiters is available to attend to passengers. Things weren't always so absurd. 
When Vinny started in the business in the 70s, it was a simpler time, for limos at least. Originally, it's just amenities like seating and bars and stereos. Now, basically, I can build you a house in a, in a limo. I put fireplaces in them. Oh, yeah, baby. <laughs> and exotic limousines seem to inspire some pretty exotic behavior. A certain element of people, their ideal is to have sex in the back of a limousine. They talk about the Mile High Club, but I don't know what they call the limousine club. We have made sex machines with speakers that fold out and have handcuffs in them, foot tie-down straps, video cameras for orgies. We have done the Pope Mobile. We have done the Strip Mobile. You also have the corporate people that turn into the party people in the evening as well, which gets pretty out of control, which ends up being kind of a hush-hush situation. For the chauffeur, privacy is close at hand. Most professional chauffeurs would rather be excluded, and you can do that with the magical press of a button. Or if the partying is starting to damage the vehicle. When it gets too out of control, we just shut everything down. It's, it's not that hard because we have total control up front. We just we can shut the whole car down. And... But in an industry that profits from pleasure, this is a last resort. Everyone loves bigger, better, faster. Especially in Los Angeles, the car capital of the world. For us here in Los Angeles, uh, everybody is extremist. We wanted to do something. To, to basically set our company apart from the other limousine industry so we would stand out and be recognized. This exotic limousine certainly does the trick. It started out as a Dodge V10 that was stretched 180 inches in the cab and another 40 inches in the bed. It has two air conditioning systems for front and back, three batteries, and a 1,000 watt sound system. It's like a mascot, so it's, it stands out like a sore thumb and everybody just, they can't believe what it is or they ask. Oh my gosh, how long is this thing? And they want to be in it, they want to go in and look at it. A lot of young children have got this thing for these big monster trucks, so the kids are just, they're kind of goo-goo off, you know, off seeing this thing. Whether you're behind the wheel, in the back, or just on the outside looking in, these mammoth vehicles make a lasting impression. It feels great to be part of someone's wedding day and when you're leaving getting hugs from them. It feels great when you're taking someone to his last day of work or it feels even better when you're taking that new baby home from the hospital in style. You're part of the nicest moments of life. 